On this Boxed In, we're talking about how the COVID-19 pandemic has ravaged the Black community and spurred a mental health crisis, all of which can no longer be ignored. I'm Maureen Connolly, Editor-in-Chief of EverydayHealth.com and the host of Boxed In, COVID-19 and Your Mental Health. Joining me today is Everyday Health's Medical Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Patrice Harris, a psychiatrist and immediate past president of the American Medical Association. She's also visiting professor, Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Harris has more than two decades of experience as a national health policy advocate, lecturer, and educator, and practicing clinician. She focuses her private practice on trauma and on child, adolescent, and adult psychiatry. Most recently, Dr. Harris was the first black woman to serve as president of the American Medical Association. One of Dr. Harris's initial efforts at Everyday Health will be to oversee black health facts and knowledge movement. Welcome, Dr. Harris. Hello, Maureen. Thank you so much. I'm so excited for our new partnership. <laughs> yeah, I am as well. So thank you so much for taking the time. Disparities in healthcare have been here all along, and, but this crisis has magnified them. We as a society, irrespective of race or ethnicity, can no longer ignore what's going on. And so my role as editor in chief at Everyday Health is to guide the editorial team on responsible and inclusive coverage for all of our readers and viewers. We are very much aware of the work that needs to be done so that this perspective is more evident across the board as it relates to our coverage. However, I must acknowledge that myself as a white American, I'm very conscious of the fact that I may not see all that needs to be addressed. And to that end, we at Everyday Health are very much looking forward to working with you over the next year to achieve this goal. So thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so the number of deaths from COVID among the black US population is disproportionately higher than any other race or ethnicity. According to the COVID tracking project, uh, which was started by The Atlantic and it tracks real-time data, they actually update it twice a week, Black Americans uh, are dying at 2.3 times the rate of white people. And doctors and public health officials uh, say that there are many factors contributing to this, but can you outline for us what these are and how all of these factors map back to one's mental health and well-being? Well, those numbers are startling, but I have to say they're not surprising uh, to uh, many who already were well aware of the disproportionate burden of illness in this country, looking at cancer and hypertension and diabetes. And certainly COVID-19 has brought into stark reality a lot of gaps in our health infrastructure in our country. Uh, but clearly issues around health inequities have been, again, brought into stark reality. And as we think about these inequities, we need to think about them as avoidable, meaning they don't have to be so. And we need to think about them in the context, of course, of social determinants of health, right? Access to transportation, affordable housing, employment, education, access to fresh fruits and vegetables. But I think it's critical for us to look even further upstream and to look at issues around structural racism and bias and discrimination. Yeah, so I guess uh, as a segue, I mean, would you say that racism is a public health crisis? And if so, can you explain what that means and I guess why everyone, regardless of their skin color, should, should care? And what can we do? Well, first of all, that's very important. Let's start there. And something you said in the beginning was the fact that everyone needs to know this information. I think sometimes there is a tendency to think that, of course you don't, and I'm sure present company excluded, uh, but there is a tendency to think that unless I share that lived experience, it doesn't impact me and I don't have to think about it. And I think it's that's one of the many reasons why it's so important to have these conversations and elevate them and have everyone realize uh, that they impact us all. And to that, and I wanna read, because I think that as we talk about racism and structural inequities and some of these issues, let's admit that sometimes the conversations can be complicated 
and hard and uncomfortable. So I always like to start any uncomfortable conversation uh, with a shared understanding and definition of what we're talking about. So a definition that I like of racism is from the American Public Health Association, if I may read it. Um, It says racism is a system of structuring opportunity and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks, uh, which is what we call race. And of course, this system unfairly advantages some individuals and communities and unfairly disadvantages those same individuals and communities and saps the strength of the whole society through the waste. And so I really like that because, you know, it really talks about the system, but it also talks about how this system saps the strength of everyone. And I hope then that is a call to action for all of us to do what we can in our own backyard, both individually and systems we belong to and organizations we belong to, to address this issue. And that that is why uh, certainly racism is a public health crisis because it's a public health threat and a public health threat impacts us all. Yeah, and I, I feel like as outlined, you know, so many of the issues just, it almost seems insurmountable, right? It's like, where does one begin? Um, and the, the point that you made about, you know, the sort of, well, I've, or I heard like grassroots, you know, how would you advise um, people, where can they start, you know, within their community to make a difference? And, and I think it does start with, it, with each one of us. We can look at organizations that we belong to. Well, first of all, we can look at our own education and what we know and understand about health and health inequities and bias and racism, and really read and learn. Uh, there, there are books out there uh, that, that I think are, are wonderful books. And I do think everyone should commit to coming to the table informed and educated. So that's where people can start. They can start with themselves and then they can maybe widen that circle talk to a couple of folks who maybe don't look like you or believe like you or live where you live and develop a relationship where there is trust there. There's trust to make mistakes. A couple of my colleagues said, oh, I'm worried about saying the wrong thing or doing the right thing, but they are doing the wrong thing, but they know they can come to me and ask me questions. And if they make a mistake or say the wrong thing, I will uh, correct that mistake and educate them about where they need to go uh, to learn more uh, if they are interested. Uh, And then you move sort of further and further out in those circles. If you are uh, seated around decision-making tables, look at who else is around those decision-making tables. And if there's not a diversity of thought and opinion and gender and race and ethnicity around those tables, then raise your hand and ask the question why. And by the way, um, well, ask the question, what can we do about it? Why might be a part of that assessment? And by the way, the data is clear. You can look at any business data. I was just reading another updated study from the Harvard Business Review uh, that says organizations perform better. They are stronger organizations uh, when they are strengthened by diversity. And inclusion and equity, by the way. I, I do hope that as we are having these conversations, that we are making sure that we are not, that the end point is not numbers, right? This is not two women and uh, five, uh, you know, black folks and, you know, three Latinx folks. It's, it's beyond that because let's just say there's no one of color around a table that doesn't mean there can't be conversations around equity and inclusion and a starting point. You know, obviously if there's no one around the table, there's work to do, but there are still things everyone can do. Yeah. I love that. And speaking of work to do, so within the healthcare system itself uh, and the responsibility that, you know, physicians um, kind of need to uphold when it comes to recognizing these issues and then taking steps to change it and do something about it. As a public health advocate, is there going to be progress? 
Sure. But there is work. And, and, and of course, as you noted earlier, I am immediate past president of the American Medical Association, and I'm very uh, proud of our leadership on this issue and our journey and our evolution. The audience may not know, but decades ago, Black physicians could not join the AMA. And in 2009, our then immediate past president, uh, Dr. Ronald Davis, who unfortunately has passed away, offered an apology. And so that's a public acknowledgement of past harm, mm. right? a recognition. And so that's where organizations can start. And then it's, what do you do next? And so we are, or we did, uh, develop the Center for Health Equity at the AMA. And we are partnering and we are looking within, you know, there's a theme there. And we are looking first at our own organization internally and then looking at ways to partner externally. So I think that's a model for every organization. Look internally, look at policies and procedures. Again, who's around uh, decision-making uh, tables? What do we need to do to understand our own biases? What do we need to do then to partner externally with the community to understand what's going on in the community and how uh, some of these issues have impacted uh, communities? And partner and be an equal partner or bring those communities in as an equal partner um, to solve problems. Yeah, and so I guess going back to the, the patient and the, you know, uh, uh, the black community um, who I mentioned at the start, you know, the, the hospitalizations, the number of deaths that are more than double the rest of the population. I guess when you're someone who's seeing those numbers and um, as a black person, you go like, I, you know, how can I trust the medical community? How, how can I, you know, not worry about my loved ones and their risk of COVID um, because there's so much risk involved, right? getting infected possibly and then hospitalized and knowing that there's just so much on the table. I don't, I don't know if, I guess if someone were to come to you if, and say, well, how can I protect myself and in, in, in this, what would you, how would you answer that? Well, as we are talking about COVID, I would start with what we can do. This is a time of uncertainty, a lot of stress and anxiety. Uh, but there are things we can do, just like you and I just had the conversation about what people can do mm -hmm. um, as we look forward to address uh, structural racism and discrimination and biases. So what can we do with COVID? And what we can do is, first of all, commit to getting our information from trusted, reputable sources. Again, one of the many reasons I'm so excited about the opportunity here at Everyday Health, because it is about being a trusted reputable source of information and engaging a commitment to engaging all communities. Um, and so that's the first uh, item on the to-do list. And then of course, people need to wear their masks because it's clear uh, that it's protective of yourself and others. Social distance, or I like to use the term physical distance because I do want to remind us to stay socially connected for our mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, not be in large crowds and watch. And I know the fa uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah, Kwanzaa holidays are coming up. And what we want to make sure is that we stay safe for now. It is inconvenient. I, I just said this this weekend. Um, it is inconvenient wearing a mask, absolutely, but it is not really hard. If we look at the things that we do in this country that are hard or the things that people do to stay healthy or get healthy, like undergo chemotherapy or radiation therapy or open heart surgery, those things are hard. This is not hard. So folks can make sure they're getting, you know, reputable information, wear a mask, uh, social distance, wash hands, all of those uh, basic things, they work actually. And if we are committed to do that, we can again begin to open up commerce. It's unfortunate that a lot of these issues, public health issues have been politicized mm. and that we, and we do this a lot in this country, not just about COVID, we have either or 
there's a zero sum game. Either I have to win or you have to win. And really, you know, it's, it's a false choice between, you know, getting our economy going again and getting our, our public health um, and getting this virus in control. So, uh, you know, again, there are, there are things we can do. And, and whenever you have this big problem, you talked about uh, many things feeling insurmountable. Uh, you, everyone should take a deep breath. I do that too. We have to do that every day because again, times of uncertainty and just list the things that we can do and start there. Yeah, and so um, I think that's wonderful advice, you know, and then things as I guess we'll do flip to the other side, which is kind of, you know, feelings of helplessness and rage and anger and grief coming up at the way in which things have been, in a lot of people's opinions, mishandled, right? I think, um, and so I guess as a result of this, um, you know, for instance, you know, having, like I mentioned earlier, somebody in the hospital and, and knowing that if you go in as a, as a black uh, person to the hospital, that your uh, chances of dying are far greater than someone who's white. So here, I guess, what have you seen as a practicing psychiatrist uh, in response to that or in regard to that? And what would you tell someone who is fearful or angry? Well, the first thing I say is give yourselves the grace and the space to feel how you are feeling. Mm -hmm. And I try not to ever minimize anyone's feeling, anger, frustration, even identifying my own feelings during this time has been very important. And when we were um, at the height of issues around George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, I really felt overwhelmed one day. And I sent an email out to some of my colleagues and said, you know, I have privilege. I am a physician. I can work from home. I have broadband um, and I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I even gave myself the grace and the space to feel how I felt. And then it's okay. What, what can I do with these feelings? And each person will have to decide that for themselves. Some people, as you know, uh, peacefully protested. Mm -hmm. uh, and by the way, you can protest in so many ways, right? So some people peacefully protested in communities and out in public. Other people uh, protested in their own space and in their own environment. Agency is a theme here. Know that you have agency over your actions and, and what you decide to do. And each one of us will decide to do something different, but that's that's another alternative to be engaged um, and to uh, say, I am going to make a difference. I have the agency, first of all, over my own body and my own life. Uh, make sure, I think everyone should make sure that they, and we all have to remind ourselves this, that, that we, each one of us is worthy, you know, of, of work and the effort. And then we have to do some basic things, you know, start new routines. Yes, we are grieving old routines. Our lives are disrupted. We can't do the things we want to do and we're grieving those. But again, back to agency, there are some things that we can do and make a plan and, and do the things uh, that you can do. And then I also say though, that to me, we all have to make a commitment and this is what we can do it everyday health, and this is what we can do at many organizations to make sure we are a part of the solution. Because I think heretofore, the, the burden has been on the people impacted to solve the problem. You know, I think this, you know, a lot of people had a diversity and equity task force, you know, or a person, or, and typically they were off to the side, uh, under resourced. Uh, not given the resources that they need and then told to solve the problem and come back. And I've talked to a lot of leaders over the last 90 days. And the first question I asked the leader is, are you invested? Are you invested in solving this problem? You may put out a statement, you may uh, say that you are committed, but you have to demonstrate that with resources and you have to own the commitment. Is everybody who reports to you, do they have metrics around this? So it's not just the people impact, it can't be 
the people impacted. It can't be communities of color solving the problem. Everyone has to take ownership. So that, that's what I say to folks who worry. I say, first of all, how do I earn your trust? If I don't have it already, I'm going to ask you, how do I earn your trust? And then, of course, I have to follow through on that. And then those of us who have positions of power and privilege uh, need to commit to use our privilege, our platform, our power to make a difference. As a practicing uh, psychiatrist, you, you work with adolescents and children. And so what message would you want to get to parents about how to help their children weather the storm, this pandemic? Well, I would say that um, you have to give yourselves the grace and space and your children. However, our children are watching. Mm -hmm. Our adolescents are watching. And so, you know, no one can be perfect. And I'm not saying anyone to hide their own feelings, but do know as parents that our guardians, grandparents, that our children often take cues from us. And so they, they watch. And if you say, you know what, I had a bad moment there, but here's what we're going to do. Let, let's make a plan. You know, let's make a family plan. Um, and I would say, listen, listen. I, I know I'm not a parent, uh, but of course, as a child psychiatrist, work with parents. And sometimes um, parents, and I do too, actually want to get in there and do something. But I think we should take a step back and listen to what our children are struggling with or feeling. Let's give them the space to say what they need to do and go from there. <laughs> One of the things early on a parent said, oh, I, you know, I talked to my 10-year-old uh, and I said, I know you're feeling sad or mad or angry. And I said, let's be careful there. They may not be feeling those things, but mm -hmm. if you tell them they are, they may <laughs> think, oh, I'm supposed to be mad or, you know, and, and so I think we have to be careful about all of those. But here's the other thing with parents um, who are nowadays juggling being a parent, being the educator and working, can't do it all, can't do it all. The best post, and I think this was a Facebook post, I think relative early on with their mom who said, yep, can't do it, not gonna try. I'm like, we're letting school go today, so. Right. Well, and I know that, you know, I love that how solution-based you are, you know what I mean? It's like, let's just try and be uh, also practical and realistic, you know, but solution-oriented. Um, but at the same time, you know, what would what worries you the most about what you're seeing unfold as it relates to COVID-19? Well, I'm worried that we won't take the time to learn the lessons that we should learn. Now, again, many of these lessons should have been learned pre pre COVID, uh, but certainly right now, COVID has forced, in a way attention on issues that people didn't have to see before because there were a lot of distractions. And during this period, there have not been a lot of other dis distractions, especially, you know, April to October or so, mm -hmm. September or so. So I think we should be intentional about learning the lessons because we have a tendency um, to, once we get through the acute phase of the crisis, we're like, we got through it. Okay, let's just figure it, you know, and, and we don't take the time or, or we're not as intentional as we need to be about the lessons learned. And I think that's going to be, and that's, I, I think, another opportunity for everyday health is to, you know, make sure that we are talking about mental health. Make sure that we are talking about trauma, but not just talking about it. We are holding those, um, holding systems accountable, right? amplifying the conversation, holding systems accountable so that, that we can move. So I worry that we will get on the other, and there, there are a lot of things on our to-do list, right? And it's going to be difficult uh, to figure out how to prioritize and which to tackle first. Uh, but I, I think we have to make sure that we do tackle um, all of these. And again, that's where teamwork comes into mm -hmm. play. Uh, physicians don't have to do it all. Uh, you know, everyday health doesn't have to do it all. You're, there's a role for, for everyone, this is, which is why we need to have what I call an all of society approach when it comes to health and wellness. Agreed. Yeah, I feel as though the tipping point, you know, is here or already arrived, right? And now it's like we can't 
I guess, move ahead unless we're willing to recognize, you know, what's happened right in front of us. But I, I, I feel like um, that we're on a, a, a good trajectory here, you know, um, that, you know, we can't go back. So um, I'm pragmatically optimistic. I'm an optimistic, I'm an optimist at heart. But I, I am a pragmatist and I, and I think that um, work and the work that we have to do and the solutions that we, you know, talked about some today won't happen without that intentionality. So I think yeah. we have to just make sure. That's a good word, intentionality. What role does telemedicine play to helping, in helping people get access to mental health support? Well, clearly COVID has accelerated uh, the use of telemedicine and, and telehealth. So uh, I was using that before uh, COVID and saw the value. However, I do not think, uh, just like I don't think about most things, that it is a panacea, it's a one size fits all, and that it's all promise and no peril. But I am optimistic. Uh, certainly we have seen in this emergency, um, those who pay for the visits, paying for the visits. And uh, again, accelerated uh, acceptance of this, both on the physician and the healthcare side and the patient side. But again, it's not a panacea and it won't work for everything. And I do think though that we will have to uh, make sure we, the lessons we learn are evidence-based. We need to take time because we could just say, oh, okay, whatever we did during COVID, let's keep doing. And I think we should, you know, take a moment, not years, but take a moment to look at the data um, in the face of improved health, improved wellness, what worked, what didn't work, what's better. You know, I think a right patient, right population, right time, right intervention. And so we will need to be thoughtful. And as we think about telehealth, we'll have to think about um, not everyone has a data plan, can afford a data plan. In rural areas or actually in some urban areas, uh, broadband is limited. Uh, more in rural areas, but again, not everyone has it in their homes. Um, and we have to think about, uh, now I know that there are some uh, seniors who are more tech proficient than I am, but not my dad is not. And so we can't forget about the good old fashioned telephone for visits. And I think there's a place for that. So we have to be careful that we just don't say, oh, okay, we're going to telemedicine now when that could Technology in general, and I speak a lot about this, have spoken about this, can further exacerbate these health inequities if we are not intentional about looking at those. Mm -hmm. And then finally, of course, when it comes to patient information in general, but particularly um, information around mental health, we have to make sure that we are intentional about ensuring privacy and confidentiality. Of course, yeah. And community. So we're all challenged now, right, in terms of how we can do our outreach, be with others, whether it's, you know, through sports or music or, you know, spiritual, religion, religious gatherings. As a psychiatrist, I guess, I don't know, what do you recommend to people in terms of how to stay together or create a sense of community during COVID? Well, you know, we are pretty resilient. I mean, not everyone and, and, and folks are struggling and we have seen surveys. Kaiser Family Foundation did a survey. The American Psychiatric Association did a follow-up survey where people are talking about the fact that they are more anxious and more stressed and sad and worried. Um, however, those are symptoms, not diagnoses. And those symptoms are actually typical, or let me just say expected, right? Mm -hmm. And so we have to make sure that that's great data and we, we, we will need to make sure we get actionable, real-time, up-to-date data. That, that's a whole other issue. We really need a more robust surveillance system in general, but particularly around uh, mental health. Uh, but, you know, people um, were, you know, on a continuum coping and using their own coping skills, whether that was, you know, prayer or meditation or 
seeking therapy or going to their psychiatrist and taking their medications, um, exercising, sleeping. So I would say call on those things, um, community, family, uh, that served you well pre-COVID. And as best you can, it won't be the same. I wasn't able to visit my father's 86 for six months. And it was quite difficult. I'm an only child, a little bit of a daddy's girl. But there's no way I was going to. And I hadn't traveled, but I wasn't even going to think about risking getting my dad ill. But we talked on the phone every evening and we're both sports fans. And so we talked about sports. So it was different. Mm -hmm. It wasn't what I wanted, but there was a way that I was able to maintain uh, connectedness with him. And so I think sometimes we have a tendency to focus on what we can't do. And there are some realities here. We can't do everything we used to do, but there are some things that we can do. So let's figure that out. We are smart, you know, ingenious people, and we can figure some things out. There'll be different. Uh, but but we can figure it out. Now, um, when you uh, don't feel like you can cope any longer, when you are no longer, or when you are having trouble with your normal activities of daily life, the one thing I want everyone to hear is, please ask for help. Mm. There is no shame. We, we get and we appreciate stigma, but let me just say, there is no shame in asking for help. We don't have to be the strong person Sometimes we get these roles, the strong person in the family, you know, we can ask for help. um, And I encourage everyone to ask for help, get professional help um, when you need it. That's great advice. And everyday health, we talk a lot about resilience, you know, the power of uh, learning how to become more resilient. And a lot of people think it's something that you need to be born with. But in fact, you know, the science shows over and over again that it's it's actually a skill that you can develop. Um, and so there's a lot on our site to help people become more resilient. And to your point earlier, you know, maybe you weren't somebody who exercised before or meditation was something you're just like, oh, please, you know, I'm not doing that. But right. now is a time to kind of revisit and say, maybe there are things I can take on that will make a difference, right? And help me manage better. And, and this is you sort of getting information because I imagine, which is one of the reasons I defined racism at the beginning. I imagine people have a perception in their mind of what meditation is, and it might be, you know, some, you know, hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo, or chanting, but mindfulness, you know, just being still and being centered, you know, um, and then the height of this early on is when I was president every day and sort of I still do this, but really thought about these numbers, but I tried to, it wasn't always successful. And that's the other thing we should not have this standard of perfection. Um, but I tried to wake up every morning and just get centered and say, okay. Um, but guess what? I have not exercised like I should. I have gained the COVID-20. <laughs> it might be more. I don't want to know. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. So I'll, we'll figure it out. We'll do something different. But yeah, so we should um, try to do those things. I think physical activity is very important. But if you're not perfect and you don't do it every day, or well, if you just you know, just do it when you can and you think about it for five minutes, that's a start. Yeah. Yeah. And also, right, being kinder to yourself, as you sort of said, just like, you know, this is a tough time, right? Yes. So, um, so to kind of close this out here, um, and I know this is sort of a big question, but I guess if you had to summarize what your overall mission is as a physician, what would you say? Physicians have a front row seat with our interactions with our patients to see the impact on all of the determinants of health, all the environmental issues that are swirling. And so what I believe is such a privilege of being a physician is that I have the opportunity and my mission is I have the opportunity uh, to first of all, learn from my patients and that make things better for that N of one that's in my office Uh, but also use that data and use the power and privilege that I have as a physician to make things better, to advocate for uh, the entire community. That's great. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Thank you for you for being here. Uh, And thank you viewers for watching. If you want more information, you can go to everydayhealth.com.
For more information and tips on navigating your health and well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic, go to everydayhealth.com slash tippy.